Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Get your Bibles out. Get them opened up. Let's run over to the book of Revelation. Yeah, that's right, we're going on. Put the fear of the end times into you this morning. I'm joking with you. We were talking about the past couple of services um, on the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to have you all today. God's good. Amen. And, um, but you know, Revelation 12, 11, let's read this. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Woo, glory. And by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. So they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. And let me say something here. Uh, kind of tapping into that very last part, we're going to have to be more concerned about pleasing God than we are concerned about ourselves. That we have to come to a place uh, uh, that, we, that our lives, are, that our, uh, our concern about the Lord and what the Lord wants and how the Lord wants things done bears more weight with us than us. Now, can I say, coming up, uh, I grew up classical Pentecostal. And what's that mean? I grew up Pentecostal holiness. I grew up one of the main... Mainline Pentecostal denominations. That would be classical. A Neo-Pentecostalism was a charismatic move. You know, it was the, the Episcopal, the Presbyterian, the Lutheran who got baptized, the Holy Ghost came out and, and started charismatic churches. Um, so, but growing up there, you know, we, we, weren't, we weren't about us, okay? Came over on the, in the charismatic move, we got all concerned about us. It was all about us. Everything was about us. You know, it was about what I had and who I am. I mean, let's understand this. You've got to know who you are in Christ. You've got to know your position in Christ. You've got to understand the righteousness of God in Christ. But all that is a means to an end to pleasing God. Coming to the revelation of who you are in Christ. God wants to bring us into relationship with him in a way that we are effective in carrying out his desire and will in the earth. Amen? So we love not our lives unto death. In other words, we can't be always all about us. Now, I've said this before. <clears throat> you could be having a um, uh, it's an all about me seminar. You feel the building up. You have, an, you have an it's all about him seminar, and they stay away even droves. What do you mean by that? You have a seminar about how you can get rich overnight in the, care, in, in the word of faith prosperity movement, and, you know, you're going to come in here, you're going to have supernatural debt cancellation, and you'll fill the building, and you'll sell all the tapes. Or, I can keep living any way I want to live, and there's no condemnation in me, so I can do anything I want to do, and you'll fill up the building, buy all the tapes. But come in and tell them that, you know, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. You can't even find the guy to open the door. Hello? Amen. Now, when Jesus told the man that, he wasn't trying to make him poor. He was trying to get him to learn to, to trust God. God would take care of him. He wasn't, he wasn't planning on him being broke. But you've got to come to the place that's not about you. Now, it's, all, it's, it's about the Lord. Amen? In that, you're going to have to have the revelation of, of righteousness. You're going to have to re have the revelation that God wants to bless you and do things. I understand the, the balance to that. I don't want to go to one ditch to the other ditch. But we cannot keep living when it's all about us and, and nothing we do. Every sermon we hear, everything we do, we give because we're going to be debt-free tomorrow morning. We don't give just because we love the Lord. There's too much, there's not enough giving just because we love the Lord. Can I get an amen from the nobody on the platform? Hallelujah. Y'all here, you're going home. All right? So, <clears throat> now we talked about how they, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. We talked about the precious blood of Christ the past few services, about the blood of Jesus. But it's also said, and the word of their testimony. 
we got to start, we got to speak what God says about things. Now, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, the past couple of Wednesday nights, we've gotten some really rich, 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 good stuff out of the first chapter of Colossians. And one of those is where Paul writes and says in Colossians chapter 1, he said, I would that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. Amen. Amen. Are you walk worthy of the Lord? You know, over there in Colossians chapter 1, and we talked about how that word worthy comes from the Greek axios, A-X-I-O-S, meaning it's used in relationship to scales, balance. You know, y'all seen the, the, old, the old scales where you, you know, they, they got the, the chain hanging over here with the thing and the chain hanging over here. And, uh, and then it talks about how that, um, this coat's just bugging me today. I'm sorry, I got me in Winston, it's getting me here. All right, we're going to come out of the coat. Anybody on television have a problem with that? If you do, get saved. All right. Hallelujah. But then over there, run over to Colossians 1 real quick. I'm quoting this for those, you know, some of, those, some of our people were here on those services. Some of you weren't. For those that were here, you, you kind of, you know, you're like, whoa, that's, that was good stuff. I, I was going, while well, I'm preaching, going, but that's good stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 10 says, um, Paul writes there, that you, walk, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now jump down here. Uh, let me find here. Verse 20. Or verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all the dwell in this fullness dwell, and having made peace through his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether there are things in heaven or things in, or things in earth or things in heaven. Now we have two things here. First of all, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The word worthy comes from the Greek axios, and it means the, the old balances. Then you go down to verse 20 where it says he reconcile. That word means be brought into proper relationship. Now, how many understand this? God, when Adam committed high treason, God didn't change. God, God's never veered from who he is. Who, fe who veered? Who veered from that relationship with God? Man, Adam, man. So man came out of what? He was the offender. He came out of proper relationship. Isn't that right? We covered this on Wednesday, but I kind of want to tap into this a little bit because of where I'm going. Man broke out of the proper relationship with God. Let me say this. God has never changed. If, if adultery was sin back here when man and Adam were in harmony, it's still sin over here. It doesn't matter how far man's gone. And man saying it's okay, and the preacher saying it's okay, or homosexuality, or uh, lesbianism, or thieving, or killing, or murdering. You know, all, God didn't change. Those things are still out of harmony, out of balance with God. On the scales where we're to come into balance, axios, that you might walk worthy, God still has the same weight on his side. It has never changed. When man offended, he came out of balance with God. Ching. God is not going to change his weight to balance with man. Man, God stays the same. We're to walk worthy. We're to come into balance. What does that mean? We make adjustments and we make changes. Now we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It, your, your testimony is not, I'm under grace, it doesn't matter. That's not your testimony. Your testimony is, what does the word of God say? You know, when sin, and we talked about this Wednesday, but I, 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 it works here. So we'll recover for those who weren't here. And for those who didn't see it on the internet or whatever. Remember, we've been delivered from the power of sin. What do you mean? The authority of sin. Sin shall not lord it over you. Sin shall not have a lording or a, an authority over you. Your testimony then is that when sin tries to abound, his grace does much more abound by your confession that I'm no longer under the authority of sin. I don't have to obey you and the lust thereof. We speak what the word says. Somebody come on now. Come on. So we're not bound by sin. Say, I'm not bound by sin. See, the blood of Jesus was offered 
to break its authority over your life, and now you enforce that with your testimony. Some people are teaching that your testimony is, you know, whoo, I'm under grace. Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's not what that, that does not mean that you sin more and his grace will, will come in more. That means when sin, the authority of sin and tries to come in to take control of your life, the grace of God empowers you to say no. So we get it backwards. See, when, you, when, when, when some of these people study stuff, they study it from a position of how much can I get away with or how much, how, how much can I uh, 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 relegate any responsibility from me onto God so I don't have any responsibility. They want to absolve themselves of all responsibility, and you can't do that. Paul said that you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. What does that mean? God's never changed on his side of the balance scales. So we do things in our life, live under the power of the blood, make the right confession. Why? Because we're reconciled. And as we do those things, the offender, through the blood of Jesus, through our confession, comes back into harmony with the one who never changes. He's still the same. He's never changed. He's never thought oh, homosexuality was okay. Well, Jesus didn't say anything about it. He didn't have to. God already said how he felt about it. All we need is love. Go read your Bible a little bit. I get so tired of people just saying, we just need the love, the love mantra. There's more to it than love. You know, the Bible says Jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Hated iniquity. Hates it. Did not embrace it. Hates it. What does that mean? He, and because man was bound to the iniquity, he came out of his grace and love to break its hold so man could then not be beholden to it by accepting the work of the blood of the lamb and making the right confession and saying the right things. We don't overcome just because we got born again. So you'll say, hey, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yeah, we are. If we'll do what he said. You're not a conqueror if you lay down and do whatever he tells you not to do. As a matter of fact, he, Paul wrote and said, don't yield your members as servants of unrighteousness unto death. But as servants of righteousness. Amen. So, you know, we have to learn. Yeah, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Oh, we, we need to thank. I, I love singing about the blood. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the blood. I said thank God for the blood. Oh, we're washed by the blood. We're sealed by the blood. We're kept by the blood. The covenant's ratified by the blood. Glory to God. But we overcome by that blood and the word of our testimony. And not counting our lives dear unto death. Amen? So we have to learn. We have to learn that, yes, we're under the blood. Thank God for the cleansing power of the blood. But we also have to say what the word says. Now what happened? Now go back, go back over your Bible to Joshua 1 8. Word of our testimony. Where do we get the right testimony? Well, look at Joshua 1 8. This book of the law. Now, how many know how many Bible books were, were, were when Joshua said that? Six. Forgot Job. Job is the oldest book in the Bible, chronologically. Okay, and then the five books of Moses come next. All right, just just kind of got you on that one, didn't I? <laughs> Hallelujah. Job, chronologically, it is the oldest book in the Bible. All right. Hallelujah. Then, then we have the, the books of Moses, which are referred to as the law. Okay, so let's say it this way. If the law was God's word to the people, then it's the word of God. And in New Testament teaching, what would we say? We would say that the Bible, the, this word of God, shall what? Not... Depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein. Now, the word meditate in the Hebrew meant to mutter. Anybody ever muttered before? You've muttered working on cars, haven't you? 
It got a bubble in it. You couldn't get it out, and you talk to it. Or you talk to yourself about it. I, yeah, I can't believe that thing did that thing. Went, went to a movie one time years ago, Jeff and, and, and myself and somebody else in the church went to see a movie, and Jeff muttered during the movie. And when I watched the movie, all of a sudden, no, he didn't. Something else, really? Jeff muttered through the movie. Hallelujah. It's like, who's that? Well, Jamie's mama will outdo any of you. She'll sit there and just talk out loud. Why, I never, I, why are they doing that? <laughs> Jamie said, I can't take my mama ever again. We just have to watch it at home when it comes out on DVD. Mama, shh, shh. And she's about ready to start up a conversation with anybody in the theater. Hallelujah. I mean, she puts a mirror in front of herself just to have somebody to talk to. No, I'm just kidding. Janie. All right. <laughs> but the mother means to say it to yourself. See, we overcome by the word of our testament. We need to be speaking what the word says. Joshua 1 8, this book of the law, or this word of God, shall not depart out of your mouth. But thou shalt meditate, thou shalt mutter therein day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe. See? Notice that confession causes us to observe. To do. Everybody say, to do. Everybody, to do. If you're observing to do, that means there's action with your confession. See, when we, when we take these little pre preachers, be better. Be more thorough. Teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Stop teaching this Mickey Mouse stuff that sells books and tapes. It gets you, gets you, everybody just loving you, thinking you're the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread, and you're leaving the half, half the story, and then coming up defeated later down the road instead of coming out victorious. Why? Because you just told them it didn't matter what they did. They could just, they could just, they're under, they're under the blood. It don't matter. They're under grace. They're under, covered by the blood. Yeah, but he says he overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and loved not their lives unto death. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate therein day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Actually, that, that phrase, have good success, in Hebrew means deal wisely in the affairs of life. Now, <clears throat> to hear some people teach, it doesn't matter how you deal with life, you're going to get the blessings anyway. Then why do you need to deal wisely in the affairs of life? Why do you need to meditate in the Word so you can deal wisely in the affairs of life if it's going to happen to you good anyhow? It doesn't. He said, you know, you'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success or deal wisely in the affairs of life. Well, how does that measure up the good success of the translation? If you deal wisely, you'll have good success. Amen. Trouble doesn't come when you're doing things wisely, biblically wisely. When you're dealing wisely, you, you avoid things. When you make good decisions, when did I preach decisions? Sunday? Did I get in decisions Sunday or last night, or Wednesday night, Thursday night. But I got it Thursday every Wednesday, and I'm sorry. I'm really having a hard time now. Now, what did I say where? <coughs> Hallelujah. And I'll go in one place, plan on preaching one thing, come out preaching something else, and I come over here, plan on preaching one thing, and I preach what I was going to preach over there, and I'm, I, it's like, oh, praise God. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. This book of all, the Word of God, now remember, we, we acknowledge that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's, that's, that's a part of the equation. It is the power of the blood of Jesus that washes us clean from sin. Thank God for the blood. We will never relegate the blood to a secondary place in our life. Without it, we cannot stand. Without it, we cannot win. Without it, we cannot go forward. Thank God for the blood. But there's also a side called, and the word of their testimony. My testimony has power because of the blood. But I will render the blood powerless if I don't have the right testimony. Oh, no, you can't do that. I'm like, no, no, you, oh, give me a stinking break. Yes, you can. Choose you this day, life or death, blessing and cursing. I, but they know, therefore, choose life. As for me and my house, we choose life. God tells us, choose life. If you don't choose to walk under the authority of the power of the blood, it won't work for you. 
There's no blessing from heaven that if you don't choose to walk in, it will work for you. Salvation has come unto all men, but the men will refuse that and go to hell. God, well, God chose to save some and God chose not to save others. Really? Is that why the scripture says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth? Because he's going to choose to send some to hell? Now, how do you reconcile that one, pal? He's not willing that any should perish. His will is that he wouldn't perish. God's will is not enough to make it happen. I wish I had somebody with a pen going, dun, 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 dun. I said God's will for it is not enough to make it happen. God wills that nobody die and go to hell. But unless they confess Jesus as Lord, unless they line their testimony up with what the blood of Jesus purchased, it will not have effect on their life. And it's just like forgiveness of sin. It's just like living in blessing. You, can, you will not live in the blessing unless you choose to walk in what God told you to walk in. I mean, you got people running around here, you don't confess your sin after you sin. Wait a second now. Why not? No, no, that's, that's sin consciousness. You know what, sin, I'm going to tell you something here. Can I get real straightforward? You go out and sin, I don't have to preach a sermon about it. You've got sin consciousness. Until you repent and ask God to forgive you and to cleanse you of it, you have sin consciousness. Because John, in the, in the epistle of 1 John, he wrote to the church and said, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. When you sin, your heart, won't, won't, your heart will condemn you. Your heart will say, hey, you did something wrong. Your heart will say, you, you did something that did what? Brought us out of that reconciliation. Place. Uh, we're no longer walking in proper relationship with God. We're out of harmony with God. The scales got tilted. God didn't change. God didn't change. So what, how do we deal with that condemnation of our own heart? We repent and ask God to forgive us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now remember, over in Hebrews chapter 9, it says that the blood of Christ purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Yeah, I know that, that in, initially that means all sin is wiped away of what we used to do in the past. But when you sin again, that same, that, that same thing will happen when the blood of Jesus is applied. It will purge your conscience from the works. Not going around telling everybody, I don't even talk about it because I'm, not, I'm under grace. And so it doesn't matter that I sinned. You're stupid because your heart will condemn you. And if your heart condemns you, you don't have confidence toward God. And if you don't have confidence toward God, you're out of faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. How do you fix all that? Repent. Repent. What did, you, what did the word say? And we have, if, we, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What happens? Jesus comes in. The conscience gets pure, purged. What happens when the conscience is purged? Our heart condemns us not. What happens when our heart condemns us not? We have confidence toward God. What happens when we have confidence toward God? We know we had the petitions we desired of him. We're back in faith. I said we're back in faith. Amen. So some of the stuff that people are saying are hurting the church. It's really binding people to defeat under the guise that they're liberating them from sin consciousness. And then people who talk about it are called uh, hate mongers and mean and hateful. And they're teaching the law and you're putting them under condemnation. No, I didn't have to put you under condemnation. Your own heart did it. Really? You go out this week, you run off, you see some other woman, you're a married man, she's a married woman, you run off and commit adultery with her, and you come back, and your heart ain't going to condemn you. I don't have to tell you the adultery's wrong, your heart's already told you. And then you turn on some preacher, he says, we don't confess our sin, his grace is already, and they go, oh, I'm liberated from, I don't have any guilt about that. They try to get it with their head, but their heart's telling them. I said, the heart's telling them, you, did, you shouldn't have done that. You violated God's law. You came out of balance with God. You're not an axios with God now. You came out of balance. Why? Because God didn't change. You added something to the measure that changed it. You're out of balance. So what do I do? I go repent, ask him to forgive me. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from the unrighteousness that I added to the scale. 
And I come back into harmony. I come back into balance with God. Now I'm walking worthy unto all pleasing. See? My testimony is that he forgives me. I can come to the throne of grace. And that I've sinned. I acknowledge it. He forgives me. I say what the word says. That if I come to the throne of grace, I'll receive help and grace in the time of need. That's a time of need. When you sin, that's a time of need. Glory to God. But all we need is love. No, 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 no. Don't you understand? The love of God made the provision so you could have that place to come back into harmony. The love of God made provision that when you were lost altogether in your sin, he quickened made you alive together with Christ. When we confess him as Lord, we are brought back in the relationship with God. Don't you understand the love of God made provision that if you miss the mark after you are born again, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, that he will purge you from all unrighteousness. He'll remove that off your scale. You'll come back into balance. You'll be back into balance with God. Don't you know that is the love of God? It is not the love of God to say keep doing what you're doing. That's a stupid mess that the hippies came up with in the 60s. They, every parent back from the 60s got Benjamin Spock book on parenting. And he did not know his head from a hole in the ground on the psychological side. He was a, he was a pediatrician. He knew how to take, take care of baby diseases and baby this. He didn't know anything about just the, the psychology. Why? He said things like, don't spank your child. You're teaching the hit. Don't, don't correct your child because you break their spirit. I'm called to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart. The word of God tells me that the rod of correction drives rebellion far from the heart of the child. The Bible says he who spares the rod hates his child. Now, I don't give a rip if you don't like that or not. Tough. The Bible said it. I don't care what Spock said. The pointy ear guy or the other one. Actually, the point of your guy had it better. Live long and prosper and be good. All right. He had it better. Well, I don't believe in spanking. You don't believe the Bible. You're, you're violating the word of God. And you're going to wonder why your kid, kid turns out to be a, a heathenistic brat. Because you didn't drive rebellion out of their heart. I love my children. I spank them. They hated it when I went to the paint store. We'd take them to the paint store. <laughs> what for? Because they got to a certain age, the little paint stores, little flimsy paint stores here with them five gallon ones. Get two of them and duct tape them together. Put something on that backside. Didn't have to, I'll tell you something. A lot of times all you had to, all you had to do was have it out in the open. <laughs> After a few times of that, they just, they just, it ain't worth it. <laughs> I have three children. None of them are, 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 are scarred. None of them are crippled. None of them are, are insanely nutso. None of them are running around talking about I'm psychologically damaged because my daddy spanked me. And it's a couple, couple of times I wonder if I did enough. No. You, the rod of correction drives rebellion from the heart of the child. And if you spare it, you hate them. That's what the Bible says. Isn't that? Now, how can you love your child and spank them? Because, because, let me tell you something. You cannot look at a three-year-old and go, now, honey, do you understand the consequences of your actions? You've set off a chain reaction here. And, you know, and this is going to have the house might burn down because you did this. <laughs> Bam! They understand if I do it again, it hurts. <laughs> now, when they get 13 or 14, you might be able to talk to them about, honey, the consequences of what you did or whatever. And then sometimes that don't work. I, I, I guess about five years ago, Nathan... He's in high school or middle school. I, I walked in the bonus room, and he's sitting there on the couch. And I said something to him, and he, he popped off something at me. And I don't know how fast it happened. It happened pretty fast. I snatched him off. <laughs> at that point in his life, it put the fear of something in him. <laughs> don't you ever talk to me that way again. Did I not? He didn't want to confess it. Did it scare you? Yeah. You know how I know? He didn't do it again. Hello? Now, you know, he, he, took, he took me down to four years, uh, uh, about, say, about a year ago, just messing around in wrestling. He took me down. I said, next time I'll just have to hurt you quick. <laughs> okay, you come in, I'm just going to hurt you quick. Just, we're going to stop playing the... 
You know, he's got that in the back of his mind. What's he going to do? I can take, take the old man. But what's he thinking? <laughs> what is that that he knows that I don't know he knows? No, I'm just messing that. I'm just messing that. But let's look. I, I heard stories of, my, of, of parents with their uh, grandparents with, the, with their kids. They used to beat them with tobacco sticks. They get up, get 17, 18 years old. They go out and they go ride and do the things they shouldn't have been doing. They came home. They just took a tobacco stick to them. Now, back in those days, if the cops had been called, the cops would have supported them. Said, if you, if you do it again, I'll take it and help them. Used to go to wife beaters. Used to go when a man was beating his wife. They'd go there and take him out the back and take the billy stick and beat the snot out of him. And say, if we come back, if we have to come back, we'll finish. Now they put him in counseling. See, we do what the word says. Now, I got off of that because we, we got this mantra that love never stops us from doing anything we want to do. And that's not love. My love for my children demanded that I corral them, that I constrain them, that I tell them, no, that you've got to go this way. You're supposed to do it that way. You're not supposed to do it that way. There are consequences if you go over here when I said go over there. My love for them. Why? Because I had to teach them the right lessons in life. Now we got people telling all the kids, don't, don't, don't tell them no. That's negativity. Did you know our public schools no longer have early uh, dismissal? It's too negative to be dismissed from school. They now have early release. My God, it sounds like they're getting out of prison. It's early release day. Not early dismissal. We don't have early dismissal. We have early release. Have you seen that on the signs? I thought, God, what Bozo said? That sounds more positive. It sounds like he just got out of jail for after 20 years. Doesn't it? Now, the love of God makes demands. So what do we do? We come in line with the word of God. How do we come in? And you thought I forgot what I was talking about, didn't you? I hadn't forgot. How do we come in line with what God said? This book of the law, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You'll meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written. Not just the part you like. Hello? We got people who run off to seminars all the time on the part they like and avoid at all costs the part they don't like and get people and heat to themselves teachers who will teach them that the part they don't like doesn't apply. It's okay. Just shut the door. He's all right. Somebody's got him. Shut the door. I mean, unless he sounds like he's dying of, you know, the bubonic plague or something, just shut the door. Yeah, there we go. C'est bon. To the tom. Amen. We, we, we meditate. We, remember, now remember, the blood of the lamb has established. What, what did the blood do? It made a way. So we could speak the word and have victory. So that the word had authority in our life. So that the word worked in our life. Amen. So now what do we do? We recognize the authority of the blood. And we, and we appreciate it by meditating in the word and, and muttering it. Why? So we can observe to do it. We've got to be observers of the word. God loves you. When God said... For us not to yield ourselves as members of un, uh, uh, servants, as members of unrighteousness, of sin unto unrighteousness. He did not do that so you couldn't have fun. Now every kid thinks mom and dad says no it's so they can't have fun. Fun, fun. We just want to have fun. I know it's girls, but guys, everybody wants to just have fun, fun. My son, once again, don't do that. I'll lose it. And my son, once again, is the example. Was under authority. Under the demand. You do not put rollerblades on unless you put the elbow pads on, the helmet on, the knee pads on, and the wrist guards on. Is this not a true statement, son? Yeah, all that. All right. So. Actually, it was a little exploding ball that circled you and, you know, and <laughs> filled up with air instantly. Had he had, had he had any of those things on, if he had had the wrist guards on, the elbow pads on, he wouldn't have come home one Sunday afternoon, the two days before the beginning of the um, 
High Point Little League baseball tournament. Going, I think I'm a man. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> and I go, no, you didn't. And I grabbed it. He just collapsed. I guess he did. And I look down. There's rollerblades on his feet. There's no helmet. There's no elbow pad. There's no knee pad. There are no wrist guards. Do what, son? Oh, give me a break. So what happened? Well, we heard we're going over to Blaze, which we always let them do because it was right at the call site. You could see them playing there before the trees grew up. You could see them over at Blake's house. Blake and Teague's and Grady lived in the cul-de-sac right there. But they slipped out of the back of Grady's, I mean Blake's house, one more house over to the playground at the, at the neighborhood, and there's a slide over there. And they, you know how kids, when they get together, they can inspire each other to new heights. And so they, they challenged Nathan to rollerblade down the slide. And the first time he did it, he caught serious air, and they all thought it was cool. I think he did it twice. It was okay. The third time, the brake caught the slide as he was getting ready to jump up and get serious air and threw his feet up, and he came down. I forgot which arm it was. Came down on this arm and completely broke one bone and green fractured the other right here at the wrist. Broke one and a half, green, green stick fractured the other. Doctor said it'd been better if he just broke that one in half. He did not observe to do all that he had been told to do. Had he had the wrist guards on, that wouldn't have happened. Now, jumping like that was not smart, but he still wouldn't have broken his wrist. The wrist guards would have protected him from breaking his wrist. He missed the little league tournament. He missed a lot of pool time that summer. We went on vacation in several places. This is how he looked in the pool. <laughs> or like this. Uh, like this. And we tried, all, we tried to put stuff over top of it. Nah, forget it. Nathan couldn't get in the pool for six weeks. Yep. How did that happen? He didn't observe to do all that was commanded of him. Amen? See, when you don't observe to do, you don't get in on the blessing. You, ask, you set yourself up for failure. So when the Word of God tells you, see, and we did not tell him to put wrist guards on because we wanted him to be uncomfortable. We did not tell him to have all that equipment on because we wanted you to be uncomfortable while you're out rollerblading, you know, and it's, it's hot and sticky and you're, you're uncomfortable. We wanted him to have it on so he was protected. And he probably would still be rollerblading down the slide today had he had that on. Because we would have never known him. We would have never got on him and hid the rollerblades and all that stuff. What do you say? God had him do that so he have a weather arm. Yeah, right. Huh? Seems legit. Seems legit, yeah. It was his command not to do that was not so he couldn't have fun. We knew the dangers of not wearing the equipment and, do, and, and just rollerblading. You could injure yourself. God does not, tells us not to sin, not so we can't have fun, but he knows the dangers of sin. And he tells us not to do things because he doesn't want us to be injured in the long run because of it. His love tells us no. God's love says no. That's why he says no, because it'll hurt you. It'll, it'll cause you trouble. Not because he doesn't want you to have fun. Amen? Hallelujah. Did y'all get anything out of this? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org 
and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.